We're good now. We're live. Okay. So uh, welcome everyone. Just um, we're going to do a presentation on the evacuation of Dunkirk. Uh, just a, a lot of slides, a few little videos to explain the uh, um, the history of it, uh, what actually happened uh, in periods of nine days, May June in 1940. Uh, and also, we're going to look at a scriptural background of, of why Britain, you know, because because the the, uh, the idea is if you, if you Google Dunkirk, the word miracle will almost almost certainly be associated with those events by everybody. Everybody calls it a miracle, and, and we can look at the details why, and we can look at the scriptures behind, you know, m maybe why uh, Britain particularly uh, could be favoured by the Lord. Uh, the the evacuation um, has a has a code name, Operation Dynamo. And uh, what we're going to be looking at is the worst defeat in British military history. That's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, and almost from the other point of view as well, uh, probably the greatest um, victory, really, uh, battle-wise. Uh, you could say since Alexander the Great, but I think Alexander the Great might have been jealous uh, of what, of what the, um, uh, the Germans achieved in a month. So uh, where are we going? Not everyone's muted, I don't think. Okay, j j just uh, as a little preamble, a few little scriptural preambles before we get into um, uh, uh, what happened. Uh, in the scriptures, it says, there's a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Uh, and nationally, uh, you find, in, particularly in the Old Testament, uh, uh, laws that apply to nations rather than individuals. Uh, that war can be legitimate, that it wouldn't be right. It's not right. Um, uh, it's not true and right to um, uh, to allow people to take all your stuff, basically. Everything, take your future, take your way of life. Uh, so, so, so there is a legitimacy in, in the scriptures for war. I like this one. It's um, a quote from Kipling. It says, uh, it's, in times of war and not before, God and the soldier we adore, but in times of peace and all things righted, God is forgotten and the soldier slighted. Uh, and, and often, often uh, uh, people that are against war uh, are only against it when, when there's no threat to them. Uh, and just an, another little note as well. And you know, we, we, they made a film in 1958 about Dunkirk, and there's one scene in that where um, um, they start to curse God on the beach. I didn't like the scene, but I've read fair, a fair bit and watched a few videos since, and the complete opposite was the truth. You know, people were uh, in those days um, uh, on the beach. Uh, there were no atheists. There were none. Uh, and, and that's recorded by soldiers and sailors. Said said maybe afterwards, but at the time, uh, a lot of prayer went up. Uh, Okay, so um, can you see that fully? That looks a bit big to me. J j j just a little, a little background to um, uh, the nations of the world, if you like. Uh, that does look a little bit big. That's from, that's from Genesis forty nine, and it's when Jacob gathers his sons together, and his sons, uh, the the twelve tribes of Israel, if you like, are going to become nations. That's what it says. Uh, 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 gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which which shall befall you in the last days. So there's a couple of things there. The last days, which means this age that we live in, really, uh, the gospel age, things things that, that are away from the ancient stories of the Bible. And the other thing is things that will befall you. You know, so things that you just, you're just going to, uh, it'll describe the characteristics of nations and also things that would happen to them. There's a story of Jacob and each son, uh, he, 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 he prays like a prayer upon them, a blessing upon them. Uh, and he's going to describe, as it says there, what will befall them in the last days. And you, you can trace these sons uh, it, uh, it, to particular nations. We can't go too long into that. Uh, otherwise, it, we'd need an hour uh, just for that. But, but it's just, um, does that appear very big to you? Oh. Well, it says, um, Joseph is a fruitful bow. Yeah, I think it does. Even a fruitful bow by a well whose branches run over the wall. And Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, 
which which um, uh, uh, for, for many reasons you had to, you would associate with Britain and America, Ephraim particularly Britain, uh, and so so we look at these things. It says um, uh, the archers of Sorley grieved him and shot at him and hated him, and then it says. Um, uh, but his bow, his bow stayed in strength. The arms of his hands were made strong by the mighty hands of Jacob. Uh, and it's talking about things to do with war. And, uh, and it carries on in, in, in other parts of the Old Testament about Jacob and his seed. He shall pour the waters out of his buckets and his seed, seed shall be in many waters and his king shall be higher than Agang and his kingdom shall be exalted. Uh, we're looking at the end of the greatest empire that the world has ever seen or towards the end of it, uh, which wasn't made by... Um, uh, man's hand really queen victoria was 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 the main player or, or so, so the main growth in the empire and she hardly went out the house you know so so she, she wasn't like a caesar or a or a napoleon uh, uh, she was a little old lady and in that time uh, this kingdom was exalted it says god brought forth him forth out of egypt he has it where the strength of a unicorn he shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through uh, with his arrows. So they were promised to, to do with Jacob and, and his seed in, the, in, in uh, what we saw before was the last days. This is the British coat of arms. Uh, it's got a unicorn. He has the strength, as it were, of a, as a unicorn. Uh, there is a crowned lion there. Uh, Dewey Mondroit is, is God on my right. And um, uh, uh, the, 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 the thing in French, it, it basically means I'll curse those that curse you. Evil to him that speaks evil of it, I think is the literal translation. But one interesting thing with the, um, with the unicorn, as it represents the nation, is it's chained. It's, cha it's always represented with a chain. And the things we're going to look at are great, but they only go so far. You know, to be born in England or, or the Commonwealth of Nations that goes along with England, like Australia, uh, is, is a, you know, people are trying to get into them. Uh, but in them, there is still, uh, uh, just by themselves, they come short of, of really um, uh, the best things that the Lord's got to offer, I suppose. <coughs> yes. Uh, just finishing, getting towards the end of it, a little scriptural introduction. He, he, this is the same. Uh, uh, Jacob is seed Israel. He, he couched, he lay down as a lion and as a great lion. Who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesses thee, and cursed is he that curses thee. And it doesn't matter who they are or what they've got or how smart they are or how strong they are. That's the way it goes. Uh, just to show a map of the tribes of Israel. Uh, uh, there they were in, 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 the, in the promised land and the, the, the point of showing the map is the things we've seen described wouldn't fit uh, with those tribes there uh, they, were, they, were for, they were for later days uh, and for different nations okay so we're going to look at um, uh, we're going to start to look at, uh, at what happened in May in 1940 I suppose a little preamble the, uh, uh, Britain and France had declared war on Germany in September 1939 when they invaded Poland. Uh, before then, they just tried to appease them. Even afterwards, they tried to appease them. Uh, that's, that's not a very nice thing to do. They threw their friends under the bus so that they could have a peaceful life. And um, uh, what happened between September and May was called the phony war or the Boer War uh, because pretty much nothing happened. And then all of a sudden it did. Then all of a sudden it did. So, so we're going to see a, a little nine minute video uh, to give us an idea uh, of what went on. We can't see that, Dad. Can you pause it? I'm standing on the beaches of Dunkirk, a port on the northern coast of France. Mm -hmm. Nearly 80 years ago, thousands upon thousands of servicemen from the British it? Expeditionary right. Force, alongside French and Belgian allied troops. You need to change the screen that you're sharing servicemen. from the PowerPoint to yeah. the YouTube. Okay. All right. So just let's, let's hang on. That one's got to stop. They're all going off at once now. Uh, <laughs> let me get back to it. Right. Let's try again. No. No, it, you have to you have to change the screen that you're sharing. So go go back onto Zoom. Okay, hang on. Just trying to pause the video. Right. 
So uh, back onto Zoom. Oh yeah, and we yeah, hang on, not that one. And then we want you to share your your internet where your YouTube video is, please. That one. No, we don't want to stop here. We just want to change the screen. Right, Mon Mon Monty, yeah, I'll do it, Zoe. One second. I'm I'm requesting control of your screen. Let me have it. Approved. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Um. Now go on. I, I think I think you need to stop sharing and then press share again. Go back onto the YouTube thing. Sorry, guys. Yeah, sorry. Uh... Share screen, right. This should be it. You ready to rock and roll? That's good. I'm standing on the beaches of Dunkirk, a port on the northern coast of France. Nearly 80 years ago, thousands upon thousands of servicemen from the British Expeditionary Force, alongside French and Belgian allied troops, stood on these sands, staring out into the English Channel, waiting to be brought to safety in England. Surrounded by German panzers and terrorized by the Luftwaffe above, their only hope would come by sea. Join me as Wargaming takes a look back to remember Dunkirk and the events leading to the evacuation. September 1st, 1939, Germany successfully invades Poland, prompting England and France to declare war on Germany two days later. The annexing of Poland, comprised of tanks, warplanes, and warships, marks the beginning of World War II as we know it in the West. May 10th, 1940, Germany invades at dawn, deploying all of its forces against France, Luxembourg, Belgium, and the Netherlands. But France has the Maginot Line, a line of fortifications standing against the borders of Switzerland, Germany, and Luxembourg, designed to deter a German invasion such as this. French soldiers position themselves along their Maginot Line, while the British Expeditionary Forces, the BEF, and the rest of the French Allied soldiers deploy themselves against the Belgium and Luxembourg borders. Because Belgium is neutral, the Allies cannot enter Belgium and prepare a defensive position. Germany brings westward Army Group B, comprised of thousands of armored vehicles, while more than a thousand bombers, dive bombers, and fighters fire upon the airfields of the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Belgium, and France. Nearly three hours after their being attacked, Belgium permits the British and French to enter the country. Within the day, most of the Dutch air force is destroyed, and Luxembourg is conquered. Meanwhile, a flaw in the Maginot Line is exploited, because the French believe that the Arden Forest is impenetrable, the area is only lightly fortified. Germany's Army Group A, made up of 41,000 vehicles, including panzers, armored cars, self-propelled guns, and more, pass through Luxembourg and into the forest. Germany crosses the Meuse River and by May 15th, captures Sedan and heads west, flanking the entire Allied army. On this day, the Netherlands surrender to Germany. With the Allies surrounded by German forces, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill activates a plan to evacuate the soldiers from the northern coast of France, codenamed Operation Dynamo. Though there are hundreds of thousands of servicemen in France, it is believed that only 45,000 troops, at best, can be evacuated. May 22nd, to ensure that nobody will escape, Germany attacks the coastal towns of Boulogne and Calais with their panzers. But there's another port that evades the Germans' attention, Dunkirk. Thousands of Allied soldiers march towards the coast in the hope of a miracle. As they march, the German Stuka dive bombers attack the soldiers below. Nevertheless, the survivors endeavor their way to Dunkirk. May 27th, Operation Dynamo commences. A handful of supply ships, ferries, and small passenger vessels set sail for Dunkirk. However, 
embarking on the boats proves challenging. The waters of Dunkirk are too shallow to allow larger vessels. To protect the port, the British and French troops establish a strong perimeter. These defenses hold back the panzers by land, but by air, the Luftwaffe attack, raining terror from above. The Royal Air Force launches its own fighters to protect the ships and the soldiers. The German and British warplanes have vicious dogfights above. By the end of the day, only 7,669 troops are evacuated. May 28th, the dogfights continue until, at last, some gathering clouds above provide cover for the Allies below. The planes cannot fly and they cannot attack. For the troops on the beaches of Dunkirk, this is a welcome moment of relief. In the east, the Belgians are still holding back much of German Army Group B until, on this day, Belgium officially surrenders to Germany. Without a Belgian defense, Army Group B has nothing to stop them from attacking Dunkirk. From every direction, the Germans pour into the northern coast. At Dunkirk, the Allies devise a new plan to ensure a more efficient evacuation. The soldiers will embark atop the Eastern Breakwater, otherwise known as the Eastern Mole, stretching out nearly a mile. The water alongside the mole is deep enough for several destroyers to dock. Dozens of ships, including destroyers, minesweepers, lifeboats, and more, evacuate 17,804 men. The breakwater evacuation proves successful, but watching the evacuated ships sink into the waters quickly dashes any hopes of crossing the English Channel. May 29th, German Stukas and Luftwaffe continue their attacks, sinking destroyers, personnel ships, and other boats, each with hundreds of evacuees on them. They attempt to attack the Mole, but do little to no damage on the breakwater itself. In spite of Germany's efforts to deter the evacuation, 47,310 men are saved. May 30th, German pressure eases once again. With cloudy skies preventing the Luftwaffe from attacking, and many of the Panzer divisions ordered south to conquer the rest of France in what is known as Germany's Operation Red. 53,823 soldiers are brought to England. Still, nearly 200,000 troops remain hopelessly stranded on the beaches of Dunkirk. May 31st, with the most powerful German Stukas now fighting in the south, the attacks leave little damage on this day. Meanwhile, the citizens of England gather together more than 100 civilian boats of every shape and size at Ramsgate, determined to save as many men as possible. Together, they make up the little ships of Dunkirk and set sail in a flotilla. Some civilians are attacked, some civilians sink. Most continue courageously. Because of the little ships, the citizens contribute to the most successful day of Operation Dynamo, evacuating 68,014 men. June 1st, recognizing that the BEF are escaping successfully, the Germans order the Luftwaffe to return to Dunkirk and stop them. Hundreds of Stukas and bomber sorties shoot down English fighters and sink ships. By land, German artillery fires upon the perimeter of Dunkirk, now being defended largely by French soldiers. Despite the attacks, 62,429 troops are saved. June 2nd, the bombing of warplanes and strafing by tanks continue, and 26,256 soldiers are saved. On June 3rd, 26,746 more. And on June 4th, during an overnight evacuation, 26,175 troops are evacuated. Operation Dynamo, estimated to save a maximum of 45,000 soldiers, saves more than 338,000 men. A significant portion of the British Army's fighting force were represented by the BEF. The rescued personnel would go on to form the core of the rebuilt army which would carry on the fight. Had they not been evacuated, it was feared that Germany could have invaded and even defeated England. The evacuation at Dunkirk, otherwise known as the Miracle of Dunkirk, remains a remarkable turning point in World War II history. By land, by sea, by air, Several nations battled over the lives of hundreds of thousands of soldiers. The miracle of Dunkirk is that in spite of all these odds, these soldiers lived.
nearly 80 years ago, thousands upon thousands of servicemen from the British Expeditionary Force, alongside French and Belgian allied troops, stood on these sands, staring out into the English Channel, waiting to be brought to safety in England. Surrounded by German panzers and terrorized by the Luftwaffe above, their only hope would come by sea. Excuse Join me. me as Wargaming takes a look back to remember Dunkirk. Right. You have to share your screen again back to the presentation. Yeah. Got it. You see uh, it? Yeah, you need to press from current slide or something. Yeah. Get it back up again. Okay. So that that, that was that gives you the um, uh, just just the overview of how fast it happens. Uh, Sorry, just just how fast it happened uh, from 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 the Germans invading uh, Holland and Belgium on the tenth of May, and then France uh, they sneaked into France. That the French had the Maginot Line, which they totally relied on, and the Germans came through a forest which they didn't believe they could come through, and they had no the, the French had no plan B basically, uh, and so the um, uh, the British Army particularly and others were trapped uh, as Holland and Belgium fell. And, and the Germans had sweeped round the other side and reached the coast of Calais and were moving up. Uh, so, so the um, uh, the, British, the British were trapped. Uh, so within 16 days, uh, an another interesting part of that is uh, uh, Britain had just changed its prime minister. Winston Churchill became the prime minister on the 10th of May uh, of that year. So uh, uh, th this is a little bit of, of, of Holland. Uh, this is a picture of Rotterdam uh, pre-war. Uh, Rotterdam lasted in uh, Holland lasted in the war for four days. Uh, um, no lack of courage, uh, but what was done to them uh, caused them to surrender. Uh, that's Holland after after the Germans bombed it. Uh, totally burnt out the heart of Rotterdam. If you go to Rotterdam and you walk around, uh, you'll come to a point as you walk away from the city centre to outwards, you, you come across red lights in the pavement, and it's to mark where the city burnt. Uh, when when the Germans bombed it uh, uh, over one or two nights, I think it was, uh, they were quite they, they they were quite practiced the Germans, and and um, uh, and then he said, look, if you don't surrender, then tomorrow is Utrecht, and the next day is Amsterdam, something along definitely Utrecht. I can't remember the other city. Uh, so 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 that that was the fourteenth of May, four days after he after he'd started, uh, uh, Holland fell. Uh, that's a statue outside of the. Uh, the War Museum, or one of the museums in Rotterdam. Don't go on a Monday. You don't open anything in Holland on a Monday, on a Monday morning anyway. And it represents the heart being taken out of the city and the heart being taken out of the country. It's an interesting thing in Rotterdam that um, uh, the, the houses don't have gas. There's no gas under Rotterdam because they never want that to happen again. Every house has, or nearly every house has, hot water pipe to it underground, but no gas uh, because of what happened uh, uh, that day, uh, though in those days, I'm just going to get rid of that. Yes, uh, my slides have, have, have um, come up a little bit crooked. Uh, this is this is a uh, so so Winston Churchill has made the prime minister on the tenth. Uh, this is his first radio broadcast. It says, "Arm yourselves and be men of valor, and be in readiness for the conflict. For it's better for us to perish in battle than to look upon the outrage of our nation." Uh, uh, and our altar, uh, as uh, as the will of God is in heaven, even so let it be. And and um, it, it Churchill, he didn't quote many scriptures particularly, uh, uh, but he did quote Providence. He he did he did believe uh, that the Lord was going to provide for the nation. At one time, uh, he in a speech he said he's been told the victory is written in the stars. He didn't say it was. He just said he'd been told it was. Uh, interesting character. Uh, uh, so Operation Dynamo, uh, by the 19th, they realised what was happening and they realised they had to do something about it. And he started to, uh, they, they ordered this fella, 
This is uh, Admiral Ramsey. Uh, he was in Dover, and uh, Churchill phoned him up and and and, and ordered him to 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 start this um, um, to start a plan to get the men off the beach. Nothing like it's ever been done before uh, with, with Britain. The idea was that Britain and France would stick together, and and they would they would push the Germans back. But the French had the army, and uh, the main part of the army was French. If the two of them were together, uh, and the, and and Britain's um, strength was its senior service was the navy, and then they were both going to look after the air force. But but France only lasted a month, just over a month. So this is Ad- Admiral Ramsey. We learn a little bit about him as we go along. He in in Dover Castle, which was which was the um, headquarters for um, uh, uh, this. Uh, the Seago and stuff. There's a room called a Dynamo room, and that's why it was called Operation Dynamo. And there's uh, our mate Winston, win with Winnie, and uh, Admiral um, Ramsey. Not Gordon. I can't remember his first name, but it's not Gordon. Yes. Uh, so uh, moving on a little bit. So the 19th of May, he started to make these plans, and on the 23rd of May, a few things happened on the 23rd of May, which are of interest. Uh, the king uh, made a speech to the nation. Uh, I could play that, but it take, takes him half an hour to say three words. Very, very, very uh, you could see that he struggled. And in this, in the speech to the nation, uh, he he called for a national day of prayer. Okay, it's something that Britain had done uh, for centuries, actually. Uh, in in um, and he called for a. Uh, um, there was one, interestingly enough, when I was looking up national days of prayer. There was one, I think it's 1847, they had a, a national day of prayer for the Irish, the great Irish famine. This nation that day has a, has a prayer for the famine. And, and the call was to the Commonwealth as well uh, to have this day of prayer. And sometimes they were called a day of, a day of humiliation. Because the idea was that, that you got big headed and things are going wrong, partly because you've been overconfident. So it wasn't really a call to um, beat up the bad guys. It was it was a call almost a slight repentance. And they had been overconfident. They were ill-prepared. It was a muddle. It was a mess, no doubt. Also on the 23rd of May, so, so the Germans are, are sweeping through 15 or 20 to 30 to 40 miles a day is the ground that they're making. Nobody's ever seen anything like that before, ever. And uh, against what was what were the superpowers, the French were even more thought of as a superpower than the British, and uh, just sweeping everything away. And um, but on the twenty third of May, Hitler ordered them to stop. Nobody knows why. Uh, uh, so they were about fifteen to twenty miles, I think, from Dunkirk. Maybe a little bit further back in in some parts. If he hadn't told them to stop. They would have more or less reached Dunkirk before the vast majority of the troops, and there could have been no evacuation. They were sweeping through, and there's, there's arguments there. Nobody knows, as I say, uh, that he, he, he was afraid that he'd run out of fuel or, or that he needed a rest. Uh, but, the, but the winners were exhilarated. They were absolutely furious uh, uh, that they'd been halted. They were halted for two days, but even on the third day, when the halt order was lifted, it took them the best part of a day to get going again. So for basically three days, uh, with the British and the French and everyone on the back foot, they had they had a chance to protect the port of Dunkirk, to dig in and to protect it and to stop this uh, um, uh, blitzkrieg, uh, lightning war. It's called. Uh, he, he had a mate, uh, old Adolf, uh, called Hermann Goering. He was in charge of the Luftwaffe, and there is a claim that uh, uh, Goering wanted to take the glory to defeat the British. And it was to be left to the Luftwaffe, uh, but as we saw in the um, in the little film, there were days of cloud cover when he couldn't do any damage at all. Uh, and I think it, I think it's not, um, uh, it, it, you know, any war since they've always believed you can't win a war by air, air power alone. Here's a little thing of interest with both Hitler and Goering. They were both highly superstitious. Hitler used to read his stars. So uh, MI5 or MI6 or whatever it was, used to read Hitler's stars to try and figure out what he was thinking. You know, the astrology stars. And um, and uh, Goering used to go to fortune tellers. It, and on serious business, he'd go to fortune tellers to see what the future held. 
There is, there's also a suggestion that they were both drug addicts. Uh, nobody knows why the halt order was made, uh, but it made all the difference. Without the halt order, uh, the, we wouldn't have happened uh, what we saw happened. Uh, this is this is a quote from from one of the um, uh, the, the German officers. It says the pocket would have been closed at the coast if only our armor had not been held back. The bad weather the bad weather has grounded the Luftwaffe. And we must now stand and watch countless thousands of the enemy get away to England right under our noses. So, uh, as I say, the king called a national day of prayer. It wasn't on that day. He called it on the 23rd, which was the same day the halt, that, that uh, Hitler issued the halt order. Um, but the, the, the day of was the next Sunday, which was the 26th of May, which was actually the first day of Operation Dynamo. Uh, but but that was it was planned um, a week or two before. Um, okay, I've got I've got to stop here. I'm going to do that thing again, only for a minute. Pardon. Right, share screen. Hang on. Hang on. No, no, that's not good. Right. Sorry about this. It should be embedded, but it's not. So there you go. And that's that. Uh, you ready? This is only 58 seconds. It takes me longer to get it up than it does to play it. But that's all right. The Empire responds to the King's call. And at Westminster Abbey, heart of the empire, the statesmen, the soldiers, the ambassadors, and hundreds of ordinary men and women join the mighty congregation. Her Majesty Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands arrives a few moments before their majesties. No one here today could foresee the grave news that has come from Belgium. All the more, it is well for us to show the world that we still believe in divine guidance, in the laws of Christianity. May we find inspiration and faith from this solemn day. Don't like that. No, no. Right. Is it? Uh, hang on. We've got to go back to. Um. Wowzer. Excuse me. Right. So what can you see now? You can't see the slideshow, can you? No, we can see YouTube. You need to... Yeah, that's okay. it. Yeah, nice. no. Slideshow again. Oh. You can see that now? Yes. Okay. From, so from current slide at the top. Yeah. All right, phew. So, so the National Day of Prayer in 1914. The reason I put this picture up, I, I did this uh, a few years ago in uh, Yorkshire, this presentation, and, and the lady on the right, Rose, she wasn't there. So I showed her uh, a couple of days later, we were up there for a few days, I showed her um, the little, the, what I've just showed you, uh, people going into Westminster Abbey. And she said, she said, I remember that. I remember that day. She said, it worked. It worked. And a fabulous, fabulous response. So, so there are still people around that, that remember that day. It's got a great testimony as well. Uh, I'll, I was going to mention a few things, but I'll skip because of time. So a few, just a couple of things from Psalm 55. Um, well, in Job, it says he dis disappoints the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot perform their enterprises. Uh, this is from a different version of the King James. It says, confuse my enemies, O Lord upset their plans, cruelty and violence at all I see in the city. And it was a, a common thing in the Old Testament when people attacked God's people. Remember that I bless those who bless thee and curse those who curse thee. That God would confound their plans, that they, they would become a big gang of idiots, really. That, 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 they're, that they're, um, um, their counsellors would become fools. 
That was a, a very common thing in the Old Testament. One of God's many ways to do whatever he, he wants to do. And he did. So, yeah. If you'd ever see the film Dunkirk, they used to drop this, um, they used to drop this leaflet uh, uh, for the British. And the British used to use it in a particular way. It shows in the film, which it is actually, uh, uh, you can get accounts of that. Um, and, and there you see, uh, but it was, uh, 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 by the time, if you see Dunkirk and Ostend, that's probably 14 miles, uh, roughly 14 miles. And um, when Belgium fell, fell, uh, then it would be about 10 miles. And the beach stretches about seven. Uh, up from Dunkirk towards Ostend, the beaches they came off stretched about seven. I might just want it. Yeah. As I say, uh, Belgian Belgian fell on the the twenty eighth. Okay. One thing that wasn't mentioned in the um, in our little nine minute video, which is very good, really, was the weather. Um, many reports of uh, for nine days the English Channel was like a mill pond, flat. And uh, uh, you know. Um, when you get to the later part of, of the um, evacuation, the little boats wouldn't have been able to travel if, if, if the waters had been choppy. The men, uh, what happened with the little boats is they got people on at the beach and took them to the big ships generally and put them on there because the big ships couldn't reach the beach, though they could reach the mole. But if the water had been choppy, getting on, getting on those little boats would have been very difficult indeed. There would have been less boats and less men. So for nine days... Uh, the weather was... It, the Met Office have actually got a couple of pages on their website about Dunkirk. Just about Dunkirk to give this... Uh, uh, saying the remarkable things. That's a weather chat. doesn't mean anything to anyone. Um, it says, a record showed that the weather during the period as if Dun Dunkirk was unusually calm. A storm which was coming up from the Atlantic turned northwards up the west coast of Ireland and had much less impact than initially predicted on the seas and at the Straits of Dover. This was a major turn of luck for the men waiting on the beaches. The maximum wind recorded uh, it was force four, uh, um, but most days it was between one and three. Perfect days, really. Uh, uh, the resulting calm sea and conditions that enabled even the smallest craft to cross the channel and saved many thousands of lives. In addition, the easterly wind direction, the amount of surf the ships um, had to contend with on the beaches uh, would have blown smoke from the... Uh, uh, skip on that one, do me as when you go to Dunkirk and the, and the beaches further north, Mallow de Baines or something, and Bray Dunes, which is a particularly nice place, actually, uh, it's advertised as a place for wind sports. Uh, like, like, like most coastal places would be. Uh, you expect wind. And for nine days, they more or less had none. Uh, this, is, this is from, from a, 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 a quite a good book that I've got. Um, it talks about the... the um, uh, the people that took the little boat says most were experienced sailors, professional or other, otherwise, but many were not. Um, had the weather been bad, some would have not risked going, neither, neither their experience uh, or their craft would have been up to it. Uh, some mariners have ever since been convinced that the uncharacteristic and miraculous calm which ruled the sea during most of the 10 days of Dunkirk permitted the evacuations of the sea, um, it, it permitted the evacuation to proceed the water was like a mill pond, it was literally heaven sent because God had work for the British nation to do. Uh, that's from a book called um, uh, The Incredible Escape of Norman, Norman Gelb, available at Amazon. Because of course, his book, I have to give him a credit. There he is. He's a New York fella. Uh, he's a good writer, actually. Uh, Reaching Dunkirk. Okay, this video should play. Never mind the first. It's only a couple of minutes long. So, so what, what we're going to look at is, is what it was like trying to reach the port. Never mind yet. Way back in 1940, it was literally chopper block with refugees, British, French, Belgian lorries, all going in one direction towards Dunkirk. And the Germans were bombing around the clock. Again at night, you would see the mothers putting the children to bed under trees and bushes and quite well.
well to do with people coming and asking you for food, very sadly you couldn't get them. Quite often when you talk shelter in the ditches, you talk to with French and Belgian women and children. And although I suppose we've got used to total war now, I wasn't used to it then. One mass of birds, blown out vehicles, some have been pushed off the road, others lay on their sides. Right, that'll do. Hopefully, the next one will come on. Oh, that's not going to start again. That's the other one. All right. So, uh, I, I, I'll read you, I'll read you the, a sapper's diary from, from the road. Uh, uh, what it was like along the road. Uh, one of the interesting things is, is what gets mentioned is, is the Stuka aeroplane, the, the dive bomber that the Germans had. And when you watch war movies, 50s and 60s war movies, uh, the, the bombers always screech. Well, that was the Stuka. It was only the Stuka that did that because they put a siren on it. The, the wind would turn this siren round. And, it, and the, the, use, the, the, the siren was to terrify people. And he said, every nerve in your body and every muscle in your body would be gripped when you heard that thing coming down. Absolute terror. And they used to they used to shoot up the Belgian villages and the French villages to get the people on the road, to block the way, uh, 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 to stop the movement, to stop the retreat, really. And um, uh, but I, I, I'll, I'll just read you a little. The other thing with the with the. Um, um, with the Stucker, which comes into play a little bit later on, it was incredibly accurate. So it was German, you know. Uh, but this is this is um, mem memoirs of a sapper. It says an army retreat is not a pleasant spectacle, and uh, none more so than the British Army in May 1940. It says several of the units remained intact. There were thousands of us who had been separated from ours, so we joined up with any unit we could find. The greatest problem was communication. Most of us uh, did not know we were got where we were going or what we were supposed to do. Uh, the German Air Force dropped leaflets with maps showing where we were and where they were. It was obvious we were being surrounded and cut off. We used the leaflets as toilet paper. Bombs are an excellent lax laxative. It says the long march to the coast was a nightmare. Towns were in ruins and burning. Civilians laying dead in the streets, roads packed with refugees. All the while, we were on under constant air attack. In spite of this, we managed to wash, shave, obtain rations and get some sleep. We were all incredibly tired, but it's amazing what can be tolerate, tolerated when needs must. We were fortunate that, it, that the weather was wonderful. I always remember taking a break in a field not far from Dunkirk. We lay down totally exhausted, uh, near to despair, but in the distance we could hear the scale of the pipes. The Black Watch pipers came marching down the road, heads ha held high and erect. Uh, the effect this had on all of us was remarkable. It seemed to give us an all an injection of morale. Uh, and we rose as one man and followed the pipers on the way to the beach. Eventually, we found ourselves with thousands of others at Malo Le Bans, a seaside resort near Dunkirk. Here was some semblance of order with officers trying to reorganize units. It says the British character and dour humor, the British character and humor revealed itself in many ways. I remember a cockney groveling with me in the sand during a particularly nasty strafing. He looked up to the sky and said, and to think I paid sixpence to see this um, blinking. Uh, uh, sorry, he said. He said. He said. Um, and to think I paid sixpence to to see the blinking hands and air display uh, right beside us. There were men of famous of a famous regiment uh, were were, were um, uh, blanching or cleaning their equipment, polishing their boots. Their officers sitting in deck chairs. They were being served tea by an orderly. They were reading papers and appeared to be oblivious while all hell broke loose around them. Finally, they marched off to the boats upholding the tradition of their famous regiments, heads erect, uh, uh, back straight with a show of discipline and defiance which boosted our morale. And, he, he, and even there in the sands, I felt, foul, uh, I felt proud to be British. Eventually, our, our turn came. We were instructed by the beachmaster uh, to move to the sea and embark in the small boats, which would ferry us out to the larger ships. I was taken on the Brighton Bell, an old paddle steamer, and I am ever grateful to the bearded naval rating who pulled me on the deck. It says one pompous officer 
trying to build to, to bring his golf clubs abroad. Uh, was also assisted by the bearded rating. It was a sight to see the dismay on his on the officer's face when the rating dispatched the golf clubs into the sea. We headed for home. He said there was nothing more joyous than to see the, the sight of the white cliffs of Dover and the prospect of being among our own people again. Tired and exhausted, we were by no means beaten. Our morale was high, and even though we realised that we'd been badly mauled by the finest fighting machine that man had ever produced, most of us wanted the, the opportunities for a rematch. We felt that we, that we, man for man, were as good as any German. I was 18 years old. So there you go, Angelo. There's a, there's a set of golf clubs in the water at Malola Bands. Probably good ones as well. Uh, th- these are the people that were in charge of the, uh, well, the general, the, the guy in the uniform, uh, uh, his name escapes me now. Uh, I've got it written down. Uh, Gamelin, I think his name is. And he was in charge of the whole uh, project of the Allied forces. Uh, but he didn't uh, trust the telephones. But the problem was, in his headquarters, he didn't have a radio. He didn't even have a pigeon. And he tried to send all the orders via um, uh, motorbike courier on those roads. Communication was appalling. Um, uh, the Air Force, the British and the French, uh, uh, when they were sent to, to bomb uh, German troops, they found that they'd gone. They were 40 miles away. They got the message a day late. It's interesting that the French ended up with more aircraft when he surrendered later on in June than when they started. It was just chaos. You know, later on, there's a question of um, the British, when they started to leave, didn't tell the French. But sometimes the French didn't tell the British. Uh, and both uh, um, the general, and that was the president, the prime minister at the time, uh, Renault, I think his name is, uh, both, uh, even earlier in the week, uh, a week before, from the 14th to the 18th, had told Churchill that the war was lost that the war had been lost uh, uh, even before, 10 days before we start Dunkirk. Just a little bit of background history. Uh, the general in part of, uh, of, of, the, of the British troops was called Lord Gort. It's a fine name, isn't it? Lord Gort. And um, uh, he stayed to the last. Uh, uh, but as, as I say, he, 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 he didn't tell the French in the first place. He took it upon himself in the chaos uh, to look after what he could look after, to affect what he could affect to get his men home because there was nothing else he could do. Here's our mate again. Uh, this is my favourite quote of all. Uh, I think this is about the 24th, couple of days before he started to take people off. And this is what he thought. He wrote to his wife and he said, the situation is beyond belief, frightful, and one wonders how the British public will take it when the full implications are realised. It's all too horrible to contemplate. I am directing one of the most difficult and hazardous operations ever conceived. And unless the bon Dieu is very kind, there will be many tragedies attached to it. The bon Dieu, he called. I, I, I like that. Uh, apparently it's le bon Dieu, but I think no, two out of three you can have, but not all three. But yeah. So uh, getting to Dunkirk, getting to Dunkirk, the, um, uh, uh, th- there was one enormous uh, stroke of luck Pastor Jack was talking about this morning about bad things that are good at Dunkirk, uh, uh, just the south side of the port, uh, the north side is where people were taken off from there was an oil refinery and the whole the whole harbour had been destroyed by the Germans full of burning ships and destroyed ships, it was useless uh, but the oil refinery was on fire so as you came towards Dunkirk from many many miles away you would see this big pillar of smoke and in the nighttime, when you imagine the nighttime, you would see a pillar of fire and it was going to lead you to the sea and you were going to get home because a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke were leading you to the place. You didn't need a map. You just had to look up. Uh, a quote from Churchill, I made Churchill about, uh, uh, you know, there was great bravery uh, in some parts in the French army, no doubt about it. Uh, you can read that one for yourself. Uh, I, I like this picture. One of the sappers, when he arrived on the beach, uh, he said he said it, it reminded them of, of reading about the children of Israel in the wilderness when he saw these snaking uh, uh, cues, if you like. And, and also, if you remember the uh, National Day of Prayer, they looked, they looked like that when they were queuing up for, 
Westminster Abbey. Uh, just a little note, uh, when they first arrived, it was totally chaotic. And the stories of uh, uh, people turned up on an ambulance, in an ambulance, left the felder in the back, and the driver and his mate jumped into a ship. There's another one of a captain. A captain had a, what's called a Batman, somebody who carried his bag and looked after him. And the two of them arrived on the beach. And when they saw the scene, uh, the captain said, go and get me bag. And the Batman said, get your own bag. I'm off. And uh, But within a day or two, order, not control, you couldn't control this, uh, but order had been restored. And then you hear stories. There was a hospital ship there. And the nurses were saying to these totally bedraggled soldiers, put your gun down and you can get on the ship because that was a requirement to get on a hospital ship. And they all refused. And that was the difference order brought. You know, uh, it was still it was still um, muddled, uh, but there was order. Uh, you'd need that. 338,226 men are coming off these beaches. Eyewitness account, it says, uh, uh, it says every man had been spared, but some of his men were less fortunate. He described how his medical orderly had his right cheek blown away. Two other men were killed. His, tele his telephonist was so shocked by the injuries that, uh, that he saw that as Ellie Man put it, he went whackers and had to be carried away laughing uncontrollably. So, yeah, a, a crazy place. Uh, the Royal Engineers, they're based in Gillingham, among other places. And just to help people to get off the beach, they drove lorries into the water at low tides, weighed them down, put planks on them, and made another... Uh, um, pier. So one of the good things, there was lots of innovation. The mall was a great innovation. It was, it was some of these ideas. It wasn't a natural thing. I mean, the evacuation wasn't a natural thing. Pictures. Boom. You can see there what's called the East Mall. One of the things with that, I think you can get four men abreast on it. It's a breakwater really to protect the harbour from rough water. And one of the quotes I've got, I'm not going to try and look it up now, but one of the quotes I've got is one guy said, uh, for all the bombing, one bomb at the, at the early part of the mole uh, was, a, was a really cut down the, greatly the number of soldiers we got off. One bomb. And they aimed at it day in and day out and they never hit it. And the Stuckers were infamous or famous for their accuracy. Uh, I read a story of one guy, he said, if you're in a pillbox and you hear the Stucker, just go and stand 100 yards away because it's going to hit your pillbox. They don't miss. So in all the days, they never uh, 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 hit this. Uh, and then uh, just where it's got the West Mole, just beyond there, is where the oil uh, um, refinery was burning. Uh, this is about a story, a, a, a ship called the Crested Eagle, um, uh, which, which um, uh, ended up on the beach. I, I, the reason I'm showing you that is because uh, that was it. Um, it was hit in the water uh, after it set off for England, and the captain brought it back. Uh, it was on fire badly uh, and beached it. But it became important because uh, in the chaos, um, it was up near Bray Dunes, which is the northerly part of the beach. And this big ship uh, standing in the, on the beach became the mark of the little ships. Don't go beyond there. That's, that's not safe. That's too close to Belgium and too close to the shells. There it is today uh, in the sand. Some of us went there a year or two ago. We've been a few times, a few of us, standing around the Crested Eagle, uh, some of the brethren there. So it's just a little map there. There's Dunkirk, and further up is Bray Dunes and the beaches between the two. Uh, yes, getting there. All right. Okay. Sorry, Monty. <laughs> Hang on. Get that on first. Yeah, I know, yeah. Right. So th this is just a little video for um this is for people. Quite a few of us have been to um to Bray Dunes. Quite a few of us. And uh, it's a beautiful little seaside town. Now, if you go to Dunkirk, there's a museum which is very good. Uh, is the, is the, can you see that picture now? Ready to show the video? Yes. So, so this is this is from a film called Atonement. I don't know what the film's about. Two ninety nine from Amazon or any good any good uh, film outlet. Um, I don't know what the film's. About. I don't know if it's any good or not. But they've got this famous scene, and in this scene, they recreate 
Bray Dunes, Jordan Dunkirk. So for those of us who've been there, you might find this a little bit interesting. Bray Dunes was a seaside resort, but as Dunkirk was a port. So, so this is this was a holiday place. I think TripAdvisor it never got good ratings in May 1940. Uh, hang on, see the thing I want to do. I say it'll mean it'll mean more to people who've been there, but it's good. That's not going to start again, now, is it? Okay. Just got to get back to the to 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 um, me slideshow. I'm getting good at this. Nearly, nearly, we're, we're getting towards the end. So, so as I say, you know, for, for those who've who've been there, um, that that isn't the actual place, uh, but it probably was the actual scene. Uh, what, 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 when you read about Dunkirk and you watch films, most of the films have read the same things you've read, without a doubt, and been to the same museums and the same places. Oh, the little ships. Uh, this is this is uh, in Gillingham Pier. Uh, my neighbour, who's on Bob, uh, he's restoring this, and uh, we're supposed to go to Ramsgate this weekend for a big celebration. Uh, the Medway Queen went to Dunkirk and made seven trips and brought back 7,000 men. And just, just a little a spiritual point, I suppose. This was the smallest one that was there. It's a rowboat. Uh, it's got a sail. It's got a room for the sail as well. And that will have taken people off the beach uh, to the bigger ships, right? Now, uh, I don't know how many that people say, that that saved, but, but just, <coughs> just on numbers and statistics, right? Uh, it's not a competition. And if that little boat hadn't been there, maybe the number in the end would have been 338,200 uh, yeah, or 150 or something. Everybody counts. You know, if you think about the spiritual side of it, small assemblies, small ships that save a few, uh, 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 all, add to, all add to the big total. That's my little spiritual point. Uh, that's a Dutch barge. Uh, I think that might be St. Catherine's Dock, actually. I think there were 30 of them. And they, they were great because they're, they're, they're pretty flat-bottomed, uh, and they would uh, go to the beach and take them to the ships. I think there were 30 of them uh, at Dunkirk. There were Irish people at Dunkirk. The Irish Navy, that's actually an Irish flag. If it was a colour picture, you would see that. They came to Portsmouth to pick up two um, torpedo gunboats, or whatever they're called, I don't know what they're called, um, from the British during the war. And while they were there, the call came for ships. And so the 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 um the ratings, the, the Irish ratings that had come uh, to pick up the little boats, took them to Dunkirk. When he went back to Ireland, he was told to keep it secret. And uh, there were also um uh, people from the Republic of Ireland that volunteered for the British Army and were at Dunkirk. But when he went home to Dublin, uh, they were told not to wear their uniforms. Um uh, the, the the British and the Irish had a, had an agreement, uh, uh, but Churchill said that uh, if if Hitler invaded Ireland, he said for the first time in history we'd have nearly every Irishman on the British side. 
said that, that that's what was happening. So yeah, but but there were Irish people there too, uh, both uh, secretly in in their own navy, undercover if you like, and, and also people that joined uh, uh, the cause. Scripture there it says nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Uh, the routes they went, the, the shortest route, they would have got shot to bits from the coast. So they went a long way round. In that map, by the way, you can see Dover and, and we're above Maidstone as you come in. We're just above Maidstone. Uh, Medway is the Medway towns are above Maidstone. Uh, the Germans were making 40 miles a day in Holland, France, and Belgium. Uh, here at Dunkirk, they are 80 to 90 miles from London. Well, they're only 40 miles from here. Which is the which is the big problem, like <laughs> so so uh, uh, yes, many problems. It says the sea from Dunkirk to Dover during these days of evacuation looked like any coastal road in England on a bank holiday. It was solid with shipping. Okay, I love this quote. This is actually it's on the Wikipedia page now. I don't think it was before. Uh, this is this is a uh, Harry Garrett. A British, uh, it was in the army, said, you knew that this was the chance to get home and you kept praying, please, God, let us go. Uh, get us out, get us out of this mess back to England. It said, <clears throat> it says, to see that ship that came to pick up me and my brother, it was a most fantastic sight. Uh, we saw dogfights up in the air, hoping nothing would happen to us. And we saw one or two terrible sights. Then somebody said, there's Dover. That was when we saw the white cliffs. The atmosphere was terrific. From heaven, from hell to heaven, was how the feeling was. You felt like a miracle had happened. This is not um, uh, re history revisionism. Um, in the film Dunkirk, it's, it shows them sending the French away. And they did at first, but in the end, not. And the last couple of days were almost exclusively French. Hundred, over 100,000 Frenchmen came off on British boats the beaches of Dunkirk and came to England. And most of them went back because the war was going on in France and eventually were taken uh, prisoners. Uh, so in the film, it's true that they were sending them away, but you need to carry on uh, playing the story to see the picture. So it tells you there the totals and you can see how many were uh, um, from the beaches and how many from the, from the mole, which again was, was an innovation. The mole was an innovation. It's a breakwater and not a pier. Uh, 338,000. Uh, they hoped for in, in the... It, well, he thought it would last two days, and he hoped for 40,000. After two days, they got um, 30 off, I think. Uh, 338,226. We didn't have another army. You know, there wasn't the, the, the bulk of the British army. If they'd have been lost, there wasn't another army to carry on the fight, and there's no one to train them. Even if there was, they started Dad's army in, in those weeks, but that's not. On the fourth of um, on the fourth of June, uh, if you've seen the film, Captain Tennant, he was in charge of the mole, and he was there all the time, and he was a character. Uh, him and uh, another guy, I can't remember his name. Um, they got in a motorboat and went along the beach shouting, "Is anybody left?" In English and in French, "Is anybody left?" And when there was no answer. They turned their motorboat, uh, they, they joined the destroyer, and they went home. And Operation Dynamo was finished, and everyone that was on the beach was taken off. Everyone. Here's a memory from a French fella. It says, that, uh, for the people of Tunbridge, the 10th anniversary of the Dunkirk evacuations brought memories closely linked with the life of the town during the, the, the war years. Uh, Tunbridge is a, is a Kent town. It says, few Tunbridge people will easily forget the hot summer of 1940. When train after train passed through the station, crammed with British, French, and Polish soldiers, hundreds of people in the in the town brought uh, food and drink for them, plus cigarettes and sweets. Many volunteer workers spent hours on the on the station platform. When the train left the, the town, all the Continental troops threw small foreign coins and souvenirs out of the train windows, and for days, local children searched the railway embankment. A letter from France. So on the 4th of um, June, the last day of the evacuation, Winston Churchill stood up in Parliament. He'd, 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 he'd booked this slot for a speech the week before. Okay, and this is, this is probably his most famous speech. We shall fight them on the beaches speech. 
One little interest but in, in, in the week before Dunkirk, uh, Churchill basically exaggerated how well we were doing. He was saying that we were having victories, the French were having victories. It wasn't true. And, and there's a scene in the film where the king gets over them and says, I called you to lead the people, not to mislead them. Right? And in all the speeches he made after that time, he never did that again, ever. You can go through the recordings of all his wartime speeches and you will not find one thing that, 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 that history will prove to be inaccurate. He only ever after that... Uh, 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 and, and what he used to do is pick out things. So it says... Um, this is from that speech. He says, uh, I have myself full confidence that of all do their duty, if nothing is neglected, and if the best arrangements are made as they are being made, we shall prove ourselves once again able to defend our island home, to rise out the storm of war and to outlive the menace of tyranny, if necessary for years, if necessary alone. And the alone thing was a bit of a shocker uh, because people were just starting to realise that France was done for. And if necessary for years also. Uh, and then it goes on, we shall fight to the end, we shall fight in France, on the seas and the oceans, uh, with ever-growing confidence in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Everyone knows that bit. But the next bit's not so famous. It says, and even if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it was subjugated and starving, then our, um, uh, our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until, in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. If you know your history, that's what happened. That's exactly what happened. I, I, just another little spiritual point as well is, is uh, Britain could never win the war, but we could lose it. And we didn't lose it. And then eventually the new world with all its power and might came, came to uh, 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 the rescue and the liberation of the old. Uh, and I think the same is true in a spiritual sense, if you like. Uh, one little interesting part, uh, th the first part of, the, um, uh, of what you see on the screen, in, in English, the English language, there's some words that derive from French and some from Old English. In that first part, there's only one word that doesn't derive from Old English, that is actually French in, in origin, and that's the word surrender. Every other word is Old English. So it is, here's another little quote. It's from the same speech, actually. Because uh, the next thing was, was then, was, was what happens next. And... Um, uh, it might be on the next slide. Uh, yeah, it's on the next slide. It says, we are told, this is in the same speech, that Hitler has a plan for invading the British Isles. This has often been thought of before when Napoleon lay at Boulogne for a year with his flat bottom boats and his grand army. He was told by someone, there are bitter weeds in England. There are certainly a great many more of them since the British expedi expeditionary force returned. In the beginning of the speech, he said, he said, wars are not won by evacuations and we shouldn't give it the attribute of a victory. He said, but it is a deliverance. And um, the other thing was the British army, the 300, well, lots, lots of those were French, but the army that came back had been through the best training course you could possibly design. What frightened them on the beaches, uh, the Stuckers eventually took their sirens off because they didn't work on people anymore. People got tougher than that. People got stronger than that. The Empire Needs Men, a nice poster there. I like this one. This is a message a little bit later on from, um, from Roosevelt to Winston. And it says, it's an introductory lesson. It says, Dear Churchill, Wendell Wilkie will give you this. He is truly helping to keep politics out over here if you're on an election. I think this verse applies to your people as it does to ours, to us. Ceylon, oh ship of state. Ceylon, oh union, strong and great. Humanity, with all its fears and with all the hope of future years, is hanging breathless on thy faith. And, and really, uh, Dunkirk was a hinge of faith. If things had gone differently there, we wouldn't be in the same position here today. Um, his reply uh, to, um, you can buy this in the Imperial War Museum, 
have took their pictures. You can buy their matchbox. This went around uh, the country. It says uh, 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 Churchill's reply to um, that little letter was, put your confidence in us. Give us your faith and your blessing and under providence, all will be well. We shall not fail or falter. We shall not weaken or tire. Neither shall the sudden shock of battle nor the long drawn out trials of vigilance and exertion will wear us down. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. We couldn't win it uh, without the tools. Uh, and if you know the story, um, in December 1941, you can buy that as well, a little gravy boat, um, from the Imperial War Museum. It's quite nice, isn't it? If you know the story, uh, um, America came into the war uh, when Pearl Harbor was bombed in December 41. And Churchill said that night when he heard the news, I slept the sleep of the saved and thankful that night. Uh, for the Germans, it was, you know, this was the place to go and get your, your pictures taken for the great victory. And they all went there and took, sent postcards home. Uh, and they were high as kites. All the equipment had been left behind. Only the men had got off with their rifles, all the equipment, including golf clubs. <laughs> and um, uh, But lots of it was kind of useless anyway, not all of it. Uh, but one of the reasons the Germans were so successful is that what we had didn't penetrate what they had. And yeah, that was the change. So I talked about the National Day of Prayer. So two Sundays later, on the Sunday the 9th, they had a National Day of Thanksgiving. And in just about every church up and down the nation, they sang this hymn. Oh, they sang this psalm. I'll read it out to you. Uh, it says in the top of my Bible, a God, uh, the godly blessed God for a miraculous deliverance. It says, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then had they swallowed us up quick when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. Uh, the streams had gone over our souls. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And um, uh, when the soldiers initially heard there was going to be a national day of prayer, they called themselves the army of the doomed because <laughs> everyone was praying for them. So uh, yeah, just a couple more. We're nearly there. Uh, it's, it's called, uh, you know, the film The Darkest Hour? That is about those days, 12 Days in May. I think that's based on a book called 12 Days in May. Very good film, a very, very good book. And um, a, a, an hour in God's t t t time would be about a month, if you know about the um, uh, year for the day stuff. And uh, But this is, a, this, is, this is a church of quote, do, do not let us speak of darker days. Let us rather speak of sterner days. These are not dark days. These are great days the greatest days that our country has ever lived. Uh, and we must all thank God that we've been allowed, each of us according to our stations, to play in part, to play a part in making these days memorable in the history of our race. Okay, nearly there, a tin of custard question. So so every, 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 um, lots of presentations, you can win a tin of custard. They do get given away. They've been given away before, look. These people have won custard. Conspiracy going on in the background there, look at that. They're whispering. Definitely. See, look, he's won a tin of custard in the past, so you're ready. What you have to do if you know the answer, don't unmute yourself, whatever you don't. Uh, if you put in the chat box and you send it, and the first one that Monty sees wins the tin of custard, Australians have an equal chance. Who's that? I've actually, I've actually forgotten his name. Oh, yeah, no, I haven't. So, so he's an Englishman, he's a sportsman, but he's also very well known in... Um, in Australia, and he came off the beach at Dunkirk, quite actually quite badly hurt. Uh, don't unmute yourself, you hooligans. <laughs> Another fellow that came off the beach was called um, Bernard Montgomery. Nice name, isn't it? I had an uncle Bernard, <laughs> and uh, um, <laughs> but Montgomery as well. Um, and he came off the beach at he, he came off the beach at Dunkirk, and uh, five years later he took the surrender of the German army. They signed it. They signed the uh, 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 the surrender over to him. Just to finish on, really, 
Uh, Australia and England, uh, we live in great countries, America. Uh, I, I was watching uh, D-Day, which is a few a few weeks ago. Um, can't see the chat. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll find out later. Uh, uh, D-Day, which, which is a few weeks ago, there was a lady from uh, Newcastle up in the northeast, and she described the day. She said, for the first time for years, I'd been out, of, I'd left my home, and I wasn't frightened. Right? And um, if it wasn't for the Lord, we'd all live like that. Uh, but uh, um, a couple of weeks ago as well, or last week, uh, we were talking to a lady in Adelaide uh, who came from Iran to live in Adelaide. And when she got to Iran, she started to look for God. And somebody, another Iranian fella said to her, what are you looking for God for? This is heaven. You can earn money. You can go to school. Nobody bothers you. This is heaven. But she knew that it wasn't inside. She knew that it wasn't. And she kept looking. She said, the first thing I did was to try to trust people and help them. She said, that didn't work. And then she found people that trusted God. And she, and she followed them. And um, she did this. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 said, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the army went to the water. And if they could cross the water, they left uh, and, and they entered in uh, uh, to, to, to a land of promise, really. And that's the same for all of us. Repent is surrender, uh, uh, not to evil, but to God. Surrender to God's word. Uh, and then baptism and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's, I bought that picture. It's artist's impression of Dunkirk. Does anyone get the answer right? You can unmute yourself now, I think. What's the answer? Has oh, anyone got it? I saw chats. Harold Abraham. No. Oh, someone got Eric, it. From Perth to Eric everyone. Liddell. No. From Perth to everyone, somebody got it. No, D Douglas Chardin. That first came in from Jill, Jill Green. Okay, well, Jill, Jill Green got it. It's Douglas Jardine. He's famous in Australia for upsetting them when, when we beat them at cricket one time. Mm -hmm. The body line, the body line, uh, the body line, the captain of England. Uh, I don't know whether he was upset because he bowled badly or, or because we won. <laughs> anyway, I don't Paul, want to start a national. So, Paul, can you stop the YouTube, please? I, I, that's I the end of the 